Well, there was no more dedicated Thatcherite than the former Scottish Secretary, Lord Michael Forsyth. He spoke to us earlier. Lord Forsyth, how will you remember Margaret Thatcher? Well, actually, I will remember as a very kindly, caring lady who was a, a great uh, friend to me and my family, but uh, more especially as a, uh, Keith Joseph described her at the last lunch she did in um, Downing Street as a beautiful giant, and she was a giant. I mean, she uh, not only changed the face of Britain and uh, saved us from the decline which seemed inevitable after the disastrous years of the early 70s, but she also was responsible, together with Ronald Reagan, for liberating millions of people from communism and also played a major part in liberating people in South Africa from the apartheid regime. And she was this curious combination of being someone with real convictions and values and determination and a, a vision of where she wanted to go, but at the same time pragmatic enough to realize that she had to engage with uh, people like Gorbachev and de Klerk. And, and this is why you will find all over the world statesmen and politicians uh, revering her. And certainly in her latter years, I spent quite a lot of time with her, we were inundated with requests from up-and-coming and, coming and uh, long past uh, politicians who all wanted to come and talk to Margaret Thatcher. Given her international reputation, why do you think she seems to have been so unpopular in Scotland? Well, I mean, the Tories have always been unpopular in Scotland. I mean, for long periods, we've had no seats at all. We've always been an anti-establishment party. And let's face it, Scotland has always been pretty uh, Labour or Liberal in its in its politics. Uh, but of course, she had the task of uh, transforming Scotland from uh, a country which was dependent on uh, industries which had got a great past and no future into the new industries, the service industries, the electronics, the Silicon Glen, the financial services which offered prosperity for the future. And of course, she absolutely destroyed the power of the trade union barons and the trade union movement uh, was born and its, its core uh, supporters came from Scotland. And I mean, part of her legacy was actually new, the creation of new labour and for, for you know, people who had sincere convictions as uh, socialists and as uh, people who believed in old-fashioned socialism, they hated her because she had destroyed what they believed in. Uh, do you think there are any points that, that you, uh, as uh, Mrs Thatcher's man in Scotland, if you like, and, and Mrs Thatcher herself, particularly latterly, is there anything you think she regrets about that period? Um, I think uh, the way in which the poll tax was implemented, uh, which was partly due to Treasury resistance, was disastrous. Um, and it resulted in the level of the poll tax being far too high. Uh, and also uh, uh, the political opponents were allowed to get away with suggesting that the Scots were being used as guinea pigs. Whereas, of course, the reality was that George Younger had pleaded with her to abolish the rating system and introduce the uh, poll tax or community charge because of the desperate impact that the rating system had had after a revaluation on people in Scotland. And even today, we still have that problem of local government finance. I don't think anybody would argue that the community charge was particularly fair um, uh, as it was implemented. And now the council tax has many of the same problems. But in terms of, of mining communities, steelwork communities, did she have any regrets as to what happened to these communities? And that's maybe where some of the lingering bitterness comes from. Well, I, I, mean, I, I think uh, not even the hardest line socialists would argue that it was possible to keep going with mines or steel mills that were no longer competitive and it was important to create new jobs. Now that does not in any way diminish the pain and suffering that was caused by that change. What made Margaret Thatcher unique was that she was a politician who was prepared to do the right thing and take the opprobrium in the interests of the country. And sadly today, I think we have too many politicians in all political parties who are too worried about what next day's press is going to say about them. I, I remember being really handbagged by Margaret when I once used an argument that said, look, this is going to do you, re you real damage. And she said, do you think that if I'd ever cared about me, we would ever have achieved as much? Uh, never use that argument for me. I care about my country, not about what people say or think about me. And latterly, I mean, uh, as I've sort of spent time with in the latter years, you know, you'll go into a restaurant and when you leave, the entire restaurant would stand up and applaud. Now that um, is not because they necessarily agreed with her, but they respected her as somebody who said what she meant and meant what she said and had the courage to carry it through. 
not uh, in any way associated with a kind of focus group politics, which I think have so devalued our public life now, where you try and find out what people want and then tell them you can deliver it without a clue as to how you're going to achieve it. As you say, you, you knew her uh, very well up, uh, up until uh, uh, the end of her life. Uh, was there any difficulty for her? Trying that She was ousted from power rather brutally. Um, was there any sense that, that she struggled to adapt afterwards? She, uh, at first she felt, I mean, she described what happened to her as treachery with a smile on her face. She was, she was horrified uh, by the way she was driven uh, from office. Uh, and, um, but over the years, she uh, uh, came to forgive some of the people. I remember persuading her to go to uh, Jeffrey Howe's um, uh, 70th birthday party, and she was reconciled. But she was literally inundated with uh, statesmen from every corner of the globe coming to seek her advice. And again with Margaret, I mean, she was a very modest person. I mean, the idea of lying in state absolutely horrified her. She believed in freedom and meritocracy. And many people in the Tory party resented her because she swept away the old hierarchy and created a meritocratic system in the party that gave people like me from an ordinary background a chance to become involved and, and make real changes. Lord for South, thanks for joining us in Scotland tonight. Pleasure. We're now joined from Edinburgh by the Scottish editor of the Daily Telegraph, Alan Cochran. And here in the studio is the former Labour MP, Lord George Fawkes, the SNP MSP, Joan McAlpine, and the former political editor of STV, Colin Mackay. Welcome all uh, to Scotland tonight. Uh, George Fawkes, do you recognise the politician Michael Forsyth was talking about there? Yes, I do. I think he was very honest and very fair. Michael ha himself has uh, uh, become uh, more uh, uh, astute and uh, reasonable in his uh, advancing years. But 18 years of Thatcher and Thatcherism made us absolutely determined to win the election in 1997. And in order to do so, we changed the Labour Party. We made it electable. We won three elections in a row as a result of that. So I think to say that... Uh, Margaret Thatcher created New Labour is going a bit far, but she certainly gave a stimulus to it uh, and to us to do it. She also uh, made, it, made us sure uh, to deliver a, a Scottish Parliament because we saw what she was doing in Scotland uh, against the wishes of the people of Scotland, not just on the poll tax uh, and on the, the mining communities, but in education, in the health service, in local government reorganisation. Uh, things that we didn't want in Scotland, that were never agreed in Scotland. And so it made us determined to set up that Scottish Parliament to deal with domestic affairs that we have today, which Joan and others are, are members of. And I think uh, uh, she's not the uh, midwife for the, for the Scottish Parliament, but she certainly did help to create it. Uh, Alan Cochran, why do you think there is a lingering hostility to Margaret Thatcher here in Scotland? Well... It was, as, as Malcolm Rifkin said, it was this bossy Southern English woman. And also because I think if she'd been a bit more upper class, the Scots could have put, put up with it. They quite like Toffs of their Tories in Scotland, but they don't like uh, the type of Tory that Michael Forsyth and to a certain extent uh, Maggie portrayed. But in, in, it's interesting to hear what George says. I mean, I actually think the Scots in this clamour for devolution so-called, the, the, the clamour being so-called, uh, they were basically basically trying to get rid of the Tories. Mm -hmm. I think if, if uh, most of them would have been happier just to get rid of the Tories and Thatcher, and uh, the, the, the Parliament came along as a bonus. But in fact, if you think about it, Thatcher might have been the midwife for devolution and the Nationalists, but it was actually the Nationalists in 1979 who set Maggie on the road to power yes. with their uh, no-confidence motion that basically ended up with Jim Callaghan's government being defeated. So uh, I don't suppose we'll hear a lot of, of that from, uh, from the SNP now in, the, in their post-mortem on Maggie. Colin McKay, you interviewed uh, Margaret Thatcher many times, and, and um, the first one was in 1975 when she'd just become leader yeah. of, of the uh, Conservative Party. Uh, and let's get a flavour of what she was talking about then. Let's look at this. How do you think you can identify with the voters of Scotland? I think the way in which I was brought up was the way in which many of my Scottish friends were brought up. One was brought up to work hard, to put a lot of stress on education, and to get on as a result of your own efforts but always to do something as well for the community as a whole. You hope to come fairly frequently to Scotland? The sort of welcome I've had today, it'll be difficult to keep me away. 
<laughs> it didn't quite work out that way, Colin. No, it didn't. I think that was the last time she ever said that. <laughs> but it was an interesting interview. It was, uh, it was the very first major British television interview she did. She was due to do one with um, um, a Robin Day, but it fell through, and so she did it with me. And uh, she also, in that interview, I was fascinated, she was very, very keen on Macmillan. Harold Macmillan, Prime Minister 57 to 63, old patrician, ex-Grenadier uh, Guards, a man who was, uh, you know, very much a one-nation Tory. And she believed in him because she said he took the nation with him. Now, many people didn't like Margaret Thatcher, but she took, if you look at the results she got in 79, 83, 87, uh, they got very, very big majorities. And the second interview I did with her, a really long one, an hour, in 86, boy, had she changed mm. from then. The voice had come down. She was by this time a world statesman. She was bossing me about. But the great thing was that as we went into that interview, which was in the gateway in Leith Walk, if you remember yeah, George and John well. that time, and, and we went in and we had to go through the set of Take the High Road. <laughs> and, of course, it's got a grocer's shop. The village shop, and of course has a, she's a grocer's daughter, so she was turning over all the goods, the spangles and the polos and the things, and she said, they don't circulate, they're stopped here. <laughs> and I said, Madam Prime Minister, that's because this is a play and not a real <laughs> shop. And then we then did this blockbuster interview talking about M3 money supply and things like that. But just after Collins, a few years after Collins' first interview, she certainly did at that time get welcomed, get cheered in Princess Street, which is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But then a few years later, when she you came to Cumnock, uh, a thousand people turned out in the industrial estate to jeer her, to, uh, to, to uh, attack her, uh, and someone threw an egg at we her, saw we, we yeah. saw it earlier on, yeah. Uh, yeah. on STV, because she had become so unpopular at the time. And in fact, uh, Dennis Thatcher said, that awful socialist MP <laughs> there leaked the fact that she was visiting. I confess I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, oh, that, there was clearly people were politicised by that, and, and Joan, you're of that generation that were yes, politicised. I, I had a, a similar experience in that I'm, I'm, I'm from Inverclyde, and uh, she was notorious for running down the shipbuilding industry in Inverclyde, and I remember when she came in the late 80s, and I was part of uh, a crowd, I was actually reporting it for the local newspaper, and people were not happy, they were like the people in mm, Cumnock. Yeah. Yeah, but she just smiled and waved and when the news went out that night you wouldn't have known the people were there um, it, she was she was able to it's all very well saying I'm sure she was very kind to her family and friends the you know the people that she socialized with as a uh, Lord Forsyth said but but she was pretty cold and callous when it came to you know c communities like Greenock and Port Glasgow and Cumnock and I don't think it should be forgotten that it's all it's very well saying you know there needed to be structural reform in the economy but if those uh, if we had b behaved like the Europeans and supported some of our, our shipyards we'd still have a better manufacturing base than we had after the Thatcher years and I think it's significant that, um, that, that down in Greenock it was the shipyard that remained within Scottish control Ferguson's which is still producing ships it, it, you know it, they saw it through the, the difficult years um, and it's, it's just a great pity that it was allowed to happen uh, Alan Cochran but we, are, but, but we are still supporting ships at the Clyde I mean, British aerospace is building frigates for the Royal Navy. There's a perversity about the Scots and Thatcher, which, which is completely nuts. I mean, there's no suggestion nowadays that we're going to restore Glen Eagles Hotel to state control, which is where it was when Maggie came in. There's no suggestion we're going to start up filling in a forum to get a phone, which is what you used to have to do with the old British Telecom. There's no, there's no uh, suggestion that anyone's going to reverse the union laws. George Fuchs is not going to reverse them. Uh, I'm sure Joe McAlpine's party is not going to reverse them. Okay. The perversity is manifold. If you, I was in Moscow with Thatcher. She was mobbed like a like a pop star. I mean, they could see the the benefits this woman was yeah. bringing okay. in defeating the the oh. Cold War and the evil empire. Josh Fix. But Adam, I think the changes would have come. Certainly, you're right. But they would have come uh, more slowly At your and, and more carefully. Uh, and with more consideration for the people, not as ruthlessly as Thatcher did it. Uh, and that was, she was ruthless. And we can say these things without uh, saying anything against her personally, because she was actually quite a kind 
person on a one-to-one -one basis. Course, and and this was a dilemma because she was very ruthless and vindictive politically, mm. but kind personally. Yeah. I think when she, she described the miners as the enemy within, for a lot of people in working class communities, that was, that was They'll a dreadful thing to yeah. say. And I think one of your reports earlier said that in the UK there were 300,000 miners uh, when she came to power. Mm -hmm. And to describe those people as the enemy within was no, unforgivable. No, she didn't describe the miners, 300,000 miners. She described the the national executive of the annual National Union of Mining Workers, and Arthur Scargill in particular, as okay. the enemy within. And if anyone lost Miner's job, it was Arthur Scargill, not Margaret Thatcher. Okay, Alan, I, Colin Mackay, you reported <laughs> a, a lot of this period, and you saw you saw that sort of change. What, what was the, the sense of the time, do you think? Well, I mean, there was this feeling, because of what Malcolm Rifkin said, bossy English woman and all that, that was part of the governing set. She was a woman, and this was something that people thought was unforgivable, mm -hmm. that she became leader of a political party and then prime minister. And women thought she should be much more feminist, whereas powerful women tend not to be. I mean, the, it was all stacked against her. But the other thing is a lot of the changes had to come. And in that second interview, the really long one, I mean, I did a lot of interviews with her, but that 86 one, she said something, I was looking at the transcript, that she did not want to see miners going into sm uh, shallow, narrow seams with geological clefts. She'd obviously read up about this. Mm -hmm. And she just wanted to see people, she really wanted people to work in safe laboratories with nice pipettes. She was a research chemist, a mm. tax lawyer, housewife, mother, statesman, Did you not understand any of that then, the mining communities, the steel working communities? There's, there's something no. there that mm. didn't quite work. Uh, there was something about her understanding of Scotland. I mean, she had a vision of Adam Smith everywhere. Mm. But uh, she, she saw the UK really as the UK. And she didn't quite grasp, I don't think, not in my experience, any questions I asked her, she didn't quite grasp the nuances of the constituent but parts of the UK. I think, I, I think that British nationalism was also something that isolated people in Scotland mm. after, the, after the Falklands War. But I think it's important not to get too hung up on, on her as a personality because she was different, because she was a woman, yeah. and because she was a but strong th personality. A she when you think about it, in her last general election in 1987, there were still 10 Tory MPs in Scotland, uh, uh, and th now there's only one. So it was, it was her values. It wasn't uh, just about her. It was our values that we were rejecting. Well, but it was quite striking. I lost all the seats. But very, very, it's very striking the fact that she was, uh, th this idea of she was the first female Prime Minister, probably in, in the Western world, I, I think, uh, and was very strong and all the rest. And she, as a feminist icon, or as a female icon, she's not really held in that high regard, is she? She's not. I noticed that Jerry Halliwell tweeted today something about her being the, the, the forebear of girl power. <laughs> but um, I don't think that, I, I really don't think in Scotland, you know, young women, certainly as a young woman, uh, growing up in that time, I didn't look at Margaret Thatcher and think that's that's where I want to be. Oh, you know? Why was that? I, I think she was just such a divisive and alienating mm. figure. And uh, although um, Michael Forsyth said she wasn't regarded as being posh, in fact, I think most people at the time did regard her as being incredibly snooty. But you know, one of the worrying things is that the present government is now doing things which Margaret Thatcher never ever thought of doing. Mm. They're punishing people with their welfare cuts, they're punishing people in all sorts of ways that Margaret Thatcher never even contemplated. And that's what worries me now, that mm. some of the spirit of Thatcherism is there, but ironically, with men implementing it, it seems to be in a sort of velvet glove, whereas when that's Thatcher true. was doing, if, doing if, it, yeah, it was hard. I don't, I don't think she was quite... I don't think she was quite as nice as, as, ever, as George is desperately trying to make out there. I mean, I think no, the, no, reason, no. Yeah. the reason she lost uh, her job was not so much the poll tax, it was the way she treated people like Geoffrey Howe well, and Nigel that's Lawson. True. That's true. I mean, it was, uh, she was, uh, it was appalling the way she treated Geoffrey yes. Howe. It was oh. inevitable, once he was done in, that she'd be done in next. Colin Mackay, uh, been spoken of as the, as the greatest peacetime Prime Minister of the 20th century. Is that, is that a fair summation of her uh, political career? She was a very powerful, very challenging woman. She loved argument. Uh, interviewing her was a very difficult thing indeed. Mm -hmm. You had to have all your wits about you, mm -hmm. and she came back at you. And then, of course, she turned on her feminine charm. <laughs> she was very good at that. She, had, she was a very powerful, very, very momentous Prime Minister. Okay. Many people David can't Owen stand her, she but she was a big whiskey one. and sex appeal. <laughs> <laughs> on, that, on that note, remember that's a fitting legacy. We'll leave it on that. Thank you all very much.